Okay, here we go. Nice and quiet. Sound speeds, camera rolling. Holding for sound. Last looks. Calling for last looks. And set and action. I need to swap batteries. You know, making movies is hard. Making movies is hard. Welcome to Making Movies is Hard, the podcast about the struggles of being an independent filmmaker. I'm Mark Purcell. I'm Liz Manischel. Do people ever say no to you? Oh, way too often. (laughs) (laughs) You just like are just this amazing force and you get to do all these creative things. Oh God, all the time. It's you, you guys are filmmakers. You know exactly what it's like. It is pushing a rock up a hill. This week, we welcome Irish writer, director, Niesa Hardiman to the show to talk about her new film, Sea Fever, which hit VOD on Friday, April 10th. So now you can see it on all VOD platforms. Um, And it was going to be released across the U.S. in theaters, but obviously because of COVID-19, that is not happening. Maybe, hopefully, it'll happen later because this movie definitely deserves a theater. It is awesome. In addition to Sea Fever, Niesa has also been very busy in the world of television, directing episodes for shows like Happy Valley uh, in the U.K., Z, The Beginning of Everything, Inhumans, and Netflix's Jessica Jones, um, among a ton of other shows. I'm really excited to talk to Niesa, but before... We do that. We have our first segment of the day, the news segment. And uh, I found an article. News, 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 news. There's an article on No Film School um, about directors' viewfinders and if they're still worth it or not. And it kind of is a funny article because it sort of starts as a review of this new viewfinder. And they're like saying all these really nice things about this viewfinder. And then they start talking about like how expensive it is. It's like ten thousand dollars for this uh, viewfinder thing. That's like really high tech, but like it's like really expensive. And then the, they kind of morphs into this questions like, do, you know, do we still even need viewfinders as directors? Like, do do directors still use viewfinders? And I, I'm really curious, Liz, do you use a viewfinder at all? I was about to Google what a viewfinder was. I mean, I remember, <laughs> like, are those the things where you get to see the different lenses? You bring the yeah. different lenses on set? Yeah, you can sometimes wear them around your neck. You'll see directors using them. Sometimes they're attached to, like, other pieces of electronics. So they can, like, you know, like, remember the framing. But it's basically, like, a way that you can, like, hold up a lens to the set or to the environment and like look and see all the different focal lengths like at a, at a twist of a knob basically uh they sometimes call it a master lens too in addition to being called a viewfinder um yeah i've never just, used one it oh, sounds really me, useful me, me neither <laughs> <laughs> what do you think but i have a viewfinder really, <laughs> i mean are they just incredibly expensive i worked for a multi-cam tv director for a few years and he would walk around with that thing and right, he looked right. like um he looked ridiculous but i think that he really loved camera like he right. really respected and got excited by camera and so he he leaned on that a lot well so my my big problem with this whole thing is so yes i have never used one before um but uh what i have done in the past is bring a camera with me with like a 35 millimeter lens on it, like a little digital camera, like a Canon or a Sony a seven three or something. And then just look through that and like take photos, you know, and then like kind of use that as like my prep work and everything. And so, yeah, it's like, I can't switch between all the focal lengths on the spot, but I do get like to like at least get an idea of what I'm looking at. And then my cinematographer, Jason, he has an app on his phone which does the yes. whole thing yes. that I'm thinking. Th- and he, he said it's like 20 bucks or maybe it's 50 bucks, but it basically gives you all the focal lengths, all the uh, dimensions. Like you can change all the aspect ratios, everything all on your phone and just use your iPhone as a director's viewfinder. And it's like, you know, with that kind of tool out there, like why would you ever spend $10,000 on this fancy, the fancier version of that, you know, it just seems insane to me, you know? And I think that's kind of what the article was about too, is like, it just seemed crazy. Like that. Are we really needing to spend $10,000 on, on a viewfinder when like, you know, like we're getting cameras that cost less than that these days. (laughs) That's like like one tenth the budget of, of one of my films. I know. Would that be, I mean, I would think if I walked around with a viewfinder and I knew, and like my crew people and collaborators and actors were looking at me with that viewfinder, they would be like, that's my salary. Like that's my salary (laughs) that you just, you're wearing that around my neck. Like, why are you paying me like so little? Um, 
I think that sounds amazing, but I have, um, I'm just like my, my eye doesn't as a, as a director is more geared towards other things. It's really just one of my foibles and like my cinematographer, Julia Swain has to like send me examples of spherical versus non-spherical lenses. Like I can't right. automatically compute those kind of things. So it's like any kind of help is wonderful, but yes, that's. We're just not rich yet. When we're rich, Alric, maybe we could carry beautiful I just, necklaces. I don't, like I don't these know things. if you need them though, because if if you can literally have an app on your phone and you could just take your phone out of your pocket and it does like a version of the thing that this more expensive, heavier, bigger, annoying thing does, um, you know, like w why wouldn't you just use your phone? Like it just seems it seems kind of it, I don't know. It seems like it's an old school thing. It's like part of like the past of filmmaking, but it's not really part of the present now of filmmaking. I don't know, but I, I'm wondering, that's just us. Maybe there's other people who love these it's things. It's probably just us. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> it's I don't probably know. just us. But Jason sounds cool. I would. I was going to make some sort of argument that like a purist would probably think that that iPhone app was not nearly as, you know, adequate, you know, um, yeah, as adequate as it, as it could be right. as or, the real or, thing. Or accurate, right? You know, it's just like yeah. maybe it's just doing a, a, a too, too shoddy of a version. But I mean, I don't know. When you're like just doing tests and just framing things up just to get an idea, like does it really need to be like exact? I mean, I don't know. But maybe on the bigger budget things on a Marvel movie, maybe it does need to be. I don't know. Um, but uh but what, what do you do like when you're, you know, scouting and you're prepping, like, do you take photos yourself? Do you leave it all up to your cinematographer? Like, how do you do your prep work like that? I want to get better about this, but I do leave everything up to my cinematographer. I mean, like we have discussions about lenses. We have just she does a camera test for me. You know, I get to see um, and make decisions based off of filters and lenses and all those things. But mostly and I think this is a mistake on my part, but I, I really live, I love to like languish in the romanticism of like, she is in charge of the visuals. She is the director of photography and I am going to be in this separate milieu and I'm going to trust her and collaborate with her and let her take on those decisions. But that feels, it feels like saying it out loud, it doesn't sound romantic. It sounds irresponsible <laughs> a little bit now. Well, I don't know. I mean, when you come to your cinematographer, do you have any kind of idea of shots or angles or things like that? Or like, do you know, like, oh, I want this scene to be played more in a wide or in close ups or do you just yeah. completely leave it up to her? Oh, no, I do a shot list and then we talk about the shot oh, okay. list and we so, add yeah, shots and delete shots. You make yourself sound a way that you're not. <laughs> Okay, if, you, okay. if you make a shot, if you make a shot list, like you're very involved in the in the visuals. Obviously. But I'm saying I'm not like it has to be this lens, it has to be this camera, right. you have to use this. Well, that's you know. that's, that's their job though. That's not yeah, their exactly. Job. Okay, you're right. I'm kind of <laughs> underplaying myself a tiny bit here, but but I do think that like when when Julia or Liz, the two cinematographers I've been working with lately, if they have a suggestion and they feel passionate about it, like to me, it's like that's. I defer to them 100%. They know what they're doing. And if they feel passionate enough to make a suggestion about um, aspect ratio or or lens choice or camera, like I always want to defer to them. Yeah, I kind of feel the same way. I like I like to have the discussions about all these things. I usually have an idea of where I want to go and what direction. But I do take my cinematographer's um, advice like very, very, you know, like, you know, it's more like there's 60, I'm 40, you know, like with that stuff. And there's some things where there I like completely lean on them if it's like, you know, a, a certain approach to a scene or whatever. But it, it all it all has to be in, in like like working with the story and working with the the movie you know and sometimes they'll make suggestions that don't work with what i'm trying to to do as a storyteller and then you know then you have to like explain what i'm you know the, the goal of this scene or like the focus or like who's whose scene it is that's usually the way i like to think of it like whose scene is this right now like which character are we focusing on and that usually like dictates a lot of conversation about like where the, to put the camera and what kind of shots to do and everything I like to sit, you know, near monitor and I, you know, the low budget sets the monitors right near, <laughs> right near camera. I remember like on set of this short, Lena, the first AC who was pulling focus asked Julia who to focus on and like 
I don't think I would have been asked that question. Like, I think Julia would have made that decision on her own um, had I not been there. And like, you're just like you're saying, like, it's really important to clarify who's seen it is, because if it's not clear, then an entire team's going to like take action based off of one decision. Like had one character been in focus versus another, that like would have changed the complete intention of the scene. If you're not having those conversations, being physically there is incredibly important. Yeah, totally. All right. I think we should move to our next segment. Segment, but before we do, I just want to shout out to everybody. Let us know. Like, do you use director's viewfinders? Like, are they important? Is the cell phone app version not good enough? Let us know. Do you guys care? Do or do you guys like Liz? Don't even know what I'm talking about at first. <laughs> like, yeah, like let us know. So next segment, we are gonna do the mailbag segment. And this week we uh, don't have any fresh emails um, with like honest to god questions. Uh, so I dug up some international iTunes reviews for us to read. Um, Liz, do you want to take the first one? We're going to take a little trip across the pond. And uh, lovely human Martin D 84 says uh, that our podcast gives me the get up and go and gives us five stars. What a nice, what a nice, cute little British phrase. All right. Um, love how this podcast just lays it out there. I've been toying with the idea of filmmaking and this podcast has given me the kick I need. Very honest, hugely informative, great job. Thank you, Martin. That's very nice of you. I, uh, I'd like to meet you someday. I like England. <laughs> Do you live in England? Yeah. I love all of the UK. <laughs> Let's go. Yeah. Thanks, Martin. That was very sweet. Um, it would be interesting to know where in the UK you live and like, are you in London? Like, are you in a smaller town? Where are you and what do you do? Um, that'd be good to know. Anyways, moving on to Germany. Uh, this one is called share the struggle slash share the love five stars by Mike Marshalls from May 24th of 2019. So this is a little bit uh, in the past. Um, he starts with, I don't know how these guys do it, but I know why they do it. They do it for the love of filmmaking. They do it to learn and teach. They do it to share the struggle, share the pain, share the joy, share the love they have for the creative process and social collaboration with fellow filmmakers. They do it to remind us that we are not alone on our individual and collective creative journeys and that failure and success are relative terms. Obviously, episode 165 is my personal favorite, but there is wisdom to soak up in every episode, especially the ones you think aren't relevant to your specific job description. The more you know about every single position on the set, the better a filmmaker you will be. Thank you, Ulrich. Thank you, Timothy. Thank you to the guest hosts and the guest hosts and the guests sharing their knowledge. <laughs> Thank you to the listeners who yearn for knowledge and encouragement. Keep on keeping on, my brothers and sisters. <laughs> wow. Wait, wait, I have so many questions. But the most important <laughs> question is, why is it obvious that episode 165 is his personal favorite? Because cause I looked this up. So <laughs> because uh, 165 is with Jean-Luc Julien, who is a filmmaker who is based in Germany. So that is why oh. this person liked that episode, because it was someone who, uh, you know, lives in the same country they live in. Um, <laughs> I love that they're like, obviously. <laughs> obviously. Well, I was like, wasn't sure what that was meaning until I saw that. And then I was like, oh, yes, of course, that makes sense. Um, but yeah, but thanks so much uh, for the really great review. Uh, that was awesome. And really, really appreciate it. And um, yeah, I hope you keep listening. And I would like to know uh, what part of Germany you're in. It would be good to know, like, are you in a big city? Are you in Berlin? Are you in a small town somewhere? Um, where are you and what do you do? Love to, love to know if you're still listening. Um, all right, Liz, take it away. Oh, hey, um, why don't we uh, take a second and get people to donate to our Patreon page? That sounds fun. <laughs> um, so if you head on under, over to patreon.com slash MMIH podcast, um, that would be amazing. If you have an extra dollar that you're not spending per month and you want to support the show, we certainly would appreciate it. And we'd love to shout out your name from the rooftops and thank you uh, profusely. Also, if you could um, write up a review, that is up. If you're thinking of like ways to make someone's day it would make our day if you wrote an itunes review on our show um or just send us an email if you have any questions or topic suggestions we'd love to hear them our email address is alric it is podcast at mickeymoviesishard.com 
So please send us an email. That would be fantastic. If you're in another country besides uh, the U.S. and you leave us an iTunes review, if you could send us an email and let us know which country you're in so I don't have to look through every single country because there's most countries that I click on, there's no reviews. And then like I'll get lucky and find a review in a certain country. Uh, if you're in Bulgaria and you leave a iTunes review, let us know so like we can actually click on the Bulgaria iTunes link and find it. Or you know, Spain or, uh, you know, South Korea or wherever, you know, um, just let us know. That would be helpful. We've been asking amazing women in the film industry to weigh in on prompts weekly. And I know we talked about COVID-19 last week, but my friend and filmmaker, Rebecca S. Grace, had something interesting to add to the conversation. Without further ado, here is Rebecca. Hi, I'm Rebecca Esgrice. I'm a writer, director, and producer, and I'm grateful to be here to share my experiences of living through the coronavirus in New York City. When Liz asked me to contribute some thoughts here today, my first thought actually was, well, being a filmmaker has uniquely prepared me to live through the coronavirus. And that's because, in my mind, filmmakers are both uh, equipped at dealing with chaos and quiet meaning um, when we're putting a project together, living through production, the chaos sometimes seems insurmountable and you're just kind of trying to get through the day and see what happens tomorrow. And I think that's sort of a fearful reality that we're all living through right now. At the same time, um, when you're in the ideation phase of a project, you're spending a lot of time alone. And like most of us, or at least me, probably not getting dressed in the morning, um, eating whatever in the fridge, uh, looking outside and seeing people socializing and thinking they're weird or crazy. And uh, that's a reality of the world that we live in now, too. And stepping away from myself as a filmmaker, I'm really just trying to practice empathy and uh, helping people who are unaccustomed to living this kind of really, again, dichotomous lifestyle. I'm also practicing empathy towards my fellow filmmakers who may have been in a really exciting moment in their own careers where a project was about to happen or a new exciting opportunity was coming their way or they were about to jump onto some really unique opportunity and everything has come to a screeching halt. So again, you know, most people like myself who are independent filmmakers, we kind of think of our films as going through a life cycle. We go, we create it, we make it, we go out in the world with it, we socialize with it, we go to festivals, we network with other uh, with other filmmakers, but also we network towards the opportunity to make more films, and that's all been stripped away from us. So we've been redirecting, and now we're thinking about sales first, and that's a strange reality. The reality of production is that things may not happen for another 6, 12 even more months than that. So I've, you know, been drawing and writing and organizing movie nights and thinking about other ways that I can be collaborative with my fellow artists, even if, if it means we can't all physically be in the same space. So I think in a time like this, it's our responsibility as arbiters of the human experience to think of other ways that we can make a contribution beyond what we're normally accustomed to. So we're giving weekly distribution tips, and I wanted to talk about the importance of owning your audience. I bring it up a lot, but an email address is worth its weight in gold. Each time you screen your film, you should be collecting email addresses of your audience because you'll never be in the same room again with a group of people who voluntarily, most likely, were organically attracted to your audience. And in this specific instance, I'm talking about film festivals, and I know it's very difficult right now to talk about that. We're in the middle of a massive pandemic. But just think about planning for the future as I give you this advice. As you build up your canon of work, each additional email address is going to be a part of your network. They may support you, patronize you, or just become a good friend or ally in this crazy world of film production. Do not underestimate the power of that film festival email address. Each audience member you have direct connection to, and not just a Facebook like, but each email address is an asset you bring to the table for publicity, distribution and marketing for your work as a whole. And now for our conversation with Niesa Hardiman. I think Niesa's like 
way too powerful for her own good. Like she, <laughs> like I'm so glad we weren't in a room together because she would get me to do anything. Like she would be like, give all your money to dolphins. And I'd be like, yes, Nyasa, whatever you say, you're so charming. So I think that she's going to take over the world in the next few years. Yeah, I mean, it's no surprise that she's had such success with the way that she uh, can communicate as a storyteller. It's like really, really convincing. I mean, if I hadn't seen the film, I would have been sold on it if I was an investor. Yeah, when she was I hadn't seen the film. It. I still haven't seen the film. I'm going to go buy it like right now. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's definitely worth it for sure. I'm, I'm excited to see this movie. Welcome, Niesa Hardiman, to the show. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you very much for inviting me. So before we get into the meat of the interview, we have our rapid-fire round of questions to get your information about Sea Fever out. So first, um, how many days did you shoot? We shot uh, 30 days. Ah, uh, luxurious. I love it. <laughs> um, and um, this, you know, this is the only controversial question. Can you talk a little bit about the rough budget? The budget was 2 million euro. Fabulous. And then how long did you work on the film from inception to being brought out to being released? From inception. So I wrote it as well as directing it. So I did seven drafts of the script uh, over the course of about four years while I was doing other things as well. After the four years, did it take longer to get financing or would you say four years was the span of, uh, of the time there? Uh, well, my producers, as soon as, uh, as soon as I showed them the kind of rough story, um, they started thinking about how to put together the finance. So as the project, as I was developing the project as a writer, they were also looking at potential financial plans. So the financing turned out to be really complicated. It was a, a co-production between four different countries. Um, oh my gosh. So that was interesting. It was Ireland, Scotland, Sweden and Belgium. And that meant that there were certain, because it was all public finance from all those countries, as well as uh, lease and tax back through the Irish uh, uh, system here, it meant that there were all kinds of ties and conditions that we had to fulfill in order to get that finance. So we had to have a head of department from each of those countries. They, they each wanted to have a member of cast, which is particularly tricky. Oh, wow. um, and then we had to film in each of those countries and we had to do a certain amount of post-production in each of those countries. So that made it really quite complicated when you're trying to find the best people, but you're trying to find the best people within the confines of this very complex set of rules that you've set up in order to win the finance. Can can we do the wow. whole episode just on what you just said? Like, <laughs> so interesting to me. Like, um, so wait, but you did well, not have... end up casting um, a lead from every country, correct? Is that... Well, interestingly, um, we have uh, we have a British lead in Hermione Corfield. We have a Scottish actor in Dougray Scott. Uh, we have a Swedish actor in Ardalan Esmaili. Uh, we don't have a Belgian actor. Um, our, we had a Belgian HOD. Our sound designer was Belgian and our music uh, and CG person was, um, was, was Swedish. Those two people were Swedish. And wow, our, my amazing. AD was Scottish. So it was all oh. very complicated. So, uh, I, I, as, as Liz also said, I mean, I have a lot of questions about all this stuff, but we have two more questions in the stat sheet. Um, how many people were on set in, I, you know, your various countries that you shot in? <laughs> uh, okay. So we had seven cast members, then I guess maybe 50 crew members. Out of all your project, how difficult was this uh, film? It was really difficult. It was really difficult. <laughs> we made it, wow. you know, it was an incredibly ambitious project to make on such a small budget. Uh, yeah, and no uh, <laughs> that was really challenging. And then the fact that there were a lot of stipulations to do with the way that it was financed, that was pretty challenging. Uh, so, for instance, I had to travel over to Belgium and do all of the sound design and all of the mix en français. Now, my French is OK, but I did have to have Google Translate open all day, oh, every wow. day to try to talk to oh, the guys about uh, about what we were doing and how we were doing it. And, you know, when you're a filmmaker, it's all about nuance, right? So trying to get, which is fortunately a French word, I appreciate that, but uh, trying to get that across to people who are not native English speakers and I'm not a native French speaker, that was hard. I really want to hear about the origin of the story and why you decided to write this film. So maybe we just start there. Like, you know, you, th you talked about it. this took you four years um, of writing multiple drafts. Like where, what, what was the, the beginning of this, this whole thing? Well, I think the very beginning was 
I love thrillers. I love psychological thrillers with a sci-fi element. I love stories that are tense and propulsive and that also explore kind of interesting, chewy, proper questions uh, that are real. Um, and for me, that's a really interesting kind of cinema, you know, where you make something that uses the language of cinema, you know, spectacle and image and complex, exciting surround sound in order to deliver something that's a metaphor that offers a kind of dreamlike correlative for what are very real, authentic, urgent questions. So that was the kind of film that I knew I wanted to make. And um, I suppose one of the things that was my jumping off point was I feel that there's a weird t tendency or trend um, in the Western world where it's, it's sort of like an antagonism towards science and scientists as if they're elite, as if they're disconnected. And you see it a lot in cinema. I think it has its roots in Frankenstein, you know, this idea that the scientist is somebody who's disconnected and amoral and has a God complex and doesn't really care about other people. And I just felt there's something really wrong with that. And, and it's really damaging us um, culturally and in terms of, you know, who we elect and how we think about science and the scientific method. So I wanted to make a story that really valorized reason and the scientific method and, and take away this idea of the scientist as unsympathetic and devoid of emotion um, and to really earth that figure in, in what science is really about, you know, which is the pursuit of the unknown, the checking of our own kind of wishful and magical thinking um, and an ability to really, truly help the people around you because you're ready to take responsibility for what's happening. So ultimately, um, what I wanted to do was, uh, was look at the scientific method versus magical thinking and think about what the values of those two things are and how they interconnect. And in that story, then tell a story about taking responsibility for myself, for my neighbors, and ultimately for the world. So was that kind of like the core message or theme that you started with when you began writing? Yeah, I'm really nerdy. So I always start from this really kind of abstract place and then move from there kind of uh, investigating and researching into those things until I find something that feels truthful to me that's also kind of exciting uh, at an adventure level. So the story turned into, it's essentially the story of a scientist. She's a marine biology student who prefers to spend all her time alone in her lab. But for her doctorate, she has to go and endure a week on this ragged, knackered fishing trawler, which is just held together with hope and spit made out of um, uh, old wood and cast iron and it is a real fishing trawler it's really still in business and it's it births about six seven people and it looks like it's about to fall apart it's rusted and wow. ancient and she is miserably at odds with the close-knit crew but when they are out in the deep atlantic days away from shore they encounter this unfathomable life form because as we know we know more about the surface of the moon than we do about the deep atlantic so there's a whole biosphere down there. You know, you can drop the Himalayas into the deep Atlantic and they would disappear because we don't even know quite how deep it is and we have no idea of what's down there. So we're going out because of the fact that we're overfishing and because of the fact that, you know, things are, are uh, becoming more and more extreme in terms of the way that we treat our planet. We're going out into these deep unknown vistas and transforming the biosphere without actually really knowing what it is. And so the crew start to succumb to this strange infection after encountering this animal. And our hero, our scientist hero, has to kind of overcome her alienation and her anxiety to win the crew's trust because she's the only one who might be able to navigate them home. I'm going off the rails for a second because I just like got <laughs> lost in your voice and your intonation and your like <laughs> wonderful way you tell a story. Like you must be tremendous in a room when you're doing a pitch. Um, can can you talk a little bit about that? Like how did you like teach me how to speak? Yes, uh, like teach me how to navigate this crazy world. Well, that's very nice of you to say, and I will I will uh, blow my own trumpet just for a brief moment, which is. Um, one of the financiers, when I was trying to persuade him to give us another 100K, uh, so laughed at me. We were, I was doing a, a pitch over the phone and he laughed at me saying, I am a business financier. I am not a filmmaker. I am used to doing venture capital investments. I want you to come into every room I go into and pitch for me. <laughs> <laughs> so he wow. gave us the money, which is good. 
<laughs> yeah, I'm not surprised. Um, I mean, I'm, and I know Ulrich has tons of questions about story, but in <laughs> true Liz fashion, I feel like you've learned more about me in the past five minutes than anyone else had, has in the SF. But like, I don't do any prep for these interviews. I don't watch the movies. I'm a mom. I am selfish and I just don't do it. Um, I really regret it right now because I wish I had seen your film. And I want to just talk a little bit about your career, if that's okay, just for a second. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm, well, here, wait, wait, what, before we get into that, Liz, one more question. Yeah, okay, and it's not fine. a story question. Um, just just going on the thread of uh, your wonderful uh, storytelling abilities, like how hard was it to convince your producers to come on board in the beginning? Or were they already some people that you worked with before and that they knew that, oh, yes, we want to make a movie with you? Or did you have to convince them in the beginning when you first had the idea for the film? Really early on, I had worked with one of the producers before and we'd made a film in Gaelic because that's like going to be a really big seller internationally, right? <laughs> uh, which was about um, uh, a kind of eco warrior in the West of Ireland. So we, we had done that several years ago and we had always kind of gone back and forth going, yeah, we should do something. Else. Yeah, we really should do something else. So um, when I approached them with this idea, then uh, I knew him and he was a friend and and. Uh, Luckily for me, uh, he had formed a company with another guy and they were specifically making thrillers and horrors and sci-fi. So this was right up their alley. So they bought in very early. All right, Liz, go, well, take it away. <laughs> no, now I feel like I'm going to derail us completely. Like, I'm going to save my question about your career for a second, because I think it's worth talking about making a movie on a boat and all the technical pressures and um, uh, permutations that occur when you have to do something like that. You know the way they say never make a film on a boat? They're right. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, while I was writing the script, um, I made contact with a woman called Cleana Connelly, who owns the boat that you see in the movie. And uh, my, my grandfather was a fisherman, so I know a little bit about trawling, and my parents are from the, or my grandparents are from the west of Ireland. So I do know a little bit about that world, but I wanted to go out on a trawler and I wanted to have the information from somebody who's really living that life. So Cleana was kind enough to invite us over to go and myself and the two producers went over and um, I will never forget the first time we met her. Uh, she lives on an island off the west coast of Ireland um, in a Gaelic speaking part of Ireland and uh, we drove and drove and drove and drove down these tiny little roads and tiny little roads and finally you see the Atlantic spread out ahead of you stunning and beautiful and wild and you walk down this ancient granite pier not a soul in sight and here is this absolutely exhausted looking trawler that looks like if you blow at it sideways, it's going to fall apart. But not only that, <laughs> it's like there's six feet between the pier and the trawler. And Cleon and her brother who were on the boat were like, hey, how are you? Come on, jump on board. And I'm looking at it going, that's a six foot jump. I don't know if I could. And they just thought this was hilarious. And it was just it was the most humiliating thing of my whole life where they had to hold my arms. And then me shaking like a leaf had to do this really incredibly naff and very poorly organized half leap, half fall onto the boat. So I re I've never felt more like a city person in my whole life. I turned to the producers going, OK, you're getting on. And they were like, you're fine. We'll watch from here. It's absolutely fine. <laughs> <laughs> So that was very that funny. Is so funny. But then they showed me around the boat yeah. and it's it's uh, it's incredibly tight. You know, the it's an 80 foot trawler. They go out, they spend weeks on the water. They're living cheek by jowl and space is at such a premium in those spaces, as you can imagine. So the whole thing is cast iron and wood. There's chains, there's ropes, there's cables. Everything is moving at speed. Everything looks completely life threatening. There are t there are holes in the middle of the deck that like go down to the next level. No railings, no safety, no nothing. You're like wandering around. You can fall off into the water at any moment. I thought this is the most dangerous location I've ever been on. Quite early in the story, I'm not really spoiling it, there is um, there is an accident. Um, and I said to Cleana, when I was watching her and all the, the her crew members, they're like dancers on the boat. You know, they're climbing up the rigging and they're right. hanging off the edge of it in, in ways that were making me come out in a cold sweat. Um, and I said to her, everybody is so elegant and so precise in their movements. Is it really unrealistic for me to say that one of the crew members would have an accident in the way that they have in the story? And she looked at her brother and the two of them roared laughing. And she went, 
Yeah, well, let's see. There was the other day, Paddy, he lost the top of his finger. Then then there's our father, of course. He <laughs> lost his leg from the knee down. And then there was that guy about two months ago who got decapitated. Do you remember? That? I thought, okay. Okay, it's fine. They have an accident. It's fine. <laughs> because, of course, joking aside, it is the most dangerous job. There is no job that kills more people in the UK and Ireland than trawler fishing. It's so dangerous. So talk to us about how you shot on that boat then. I mean, because uh, and, and what percentage of the movie is on the actual boat and what is sex? I know a lot of it had to be set, at least the, um, the interior. Yeah, I, I planned the shoot really carefully. So um, I, th- I wanted to shoot as much as possible on the boat because it's so great for the actors and nothing really beats actually being on the boat. So obviously all the exteriors, everything that's on deck, everything that you see, we are really on the boat. We're really out at sea. Um, but when it came to shooting on the interiors, once they'd shown, shown me the interior of the boat, I thought, we'll never get a crew in here. Like, at best, we'd get the actors in. <laughs> and even right. then, it wouldn't be very roomy. So what we did was we measured up the whole boat and we rebuilt the interior of the boat on a soundstage. Jeez. And our designer was wow. absolutely brilliant. What he did was he built the whole boat with ceilings, with ladders, the whole thing, so that the actors can move from one part of the boat to the other part of the boat without stopping and never feel like they're outside. So they have that real sense of claustrophobia and you really feel it, I think, in the images. And then what we did was the camera is always, the camera is never anywhere but inside the boat. So you can never, you never get more space than you would if you were really in the boat. But we were able to remove certain timbers and get the lens inside the boat but keep the 50 hairy blokes who are on the set outside on the soundstage rather than inside in the boat so that there's room for the actors to move through. But the actors were really kind of experiencing that claustrophobia. But I think it was hugely helpful that we shot on the boat first um, so that they could all get seasick and know what that's like, <laughs> and know what it's like to be on the boat <laughs> and have that sense of community and you know the constant work of being on the boat and what it's like to be out at sea. Um, and uh, I have to say, Dougray and Connie were amazing. They learned how to pilot that trawler, which is really complicated and difficult and wow. combines this kind of 19th century thing of having the ship's wheel and understanding a bit like driving an old car. You know, you have to really extend your sensibilities to understand where the edges are, as well as understanding, you know, there's GPS and there's all this 21st century technology that's sort of, you know, gaffer taped and, and held on by pieces of string in this really, really old wheelhouse. And they all did that and they all really embraced it. So that by the time we got to the set, they really knew what they were doing and they were able to kind of suspend their disbelief and live on this boat on the soundstage. When they were on the boat, when you were working with the actors on the boat, where did they go when they were not on camera? Like, did they go underneath in that very small space? Did they just go by camera or I mean, were they very uh, accommodating? They went below decks. The, uh, the, The real trawler crew, of course, were on the boat with us because we are not as good as they are at, you know, preventing ourselves from drowning so uh, so they were there at all times um so they very kindly stayed below deck and uh, and and we filmed on deck so when the when the the cast weren't actually in the scene they would be below deck and um, playing poker with the crew forgive me if i get this wrong but that accident that you described that did happen on the actual boat right yeah. like above yeah. deck and so how the heck did you do that uh well <laughs> Um, again, it was on advice from uh, from the woman who owns the boat. Uh, you know, what's the what is the kind of thing that's likely to happen? In what way do people lose attention such that they can be injured? Um, and then it had to be something that, you know, we didn't want to we didn't want to sever anybody's limbs, <laughs> but it needed right. to be something that that was credible. So it's just a moment of inattention with all of this really heavy machinery around you that causes this horrible accident because you actually the the thing that he's operating in the movie was that the actual that's the real winch yeah that's the real winch. right the real winch right and so you just had him it it go off and then you added blood or or whatever just to kind of make it look like it hurt his hand yeah so it 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 is a real winch very convincing i mean geez (laughs) (laughs) and where he puts his hand is that's all rooted in truth that's that's the kind of thing that can happen because you're not really quite looking and it's not where the kind of the big chains are moving it's a slightly smaller part of the mechanism where it's easy to forget that it's moving at great speed and and is not going to be forgiving for anybody's fingers so did you spend like 10 days uh, shooting on the boat? No, we spent uh, we spent six days shooting on the boat and then 
we had, uh, let me see, we spent five days shooting in a tank in Sweden for all the underwater stuff. So that's 11, oh, wow. 30 day shoot. So that's. So 19 days for yeah. the set, the set yeah. work. Wow. Amazing. It's all so awesome. What a great idea to build the actual boat. But my, my one question, and I know this is what my cinematographer would be hounding me on is how, how did you light it? <laughs> well, you're dead right. And we lit it mostly with practicals. So we used, um, oh, wow. we used uh, the um, mini Alexa. We ended up shooting um, anamorphic uh, and uh, we used a lot of Atmos uh, on the set because as you can imagine, the boat is it's quite stuffy uh, and it's quite dark and it's quite dusty. Um, so in order to reproduce that, it was mostly practical lights and a lot of Atmos. And then the underwater stuff, uh, like, you know, that's like a thing that like when you're making a movie on a boat, it's like, okay, of course we need to shoot underwater sequences, obviously. And especially for your film where, you know, the creature is so, um, you know, tied to being underwater. Uh, how did you approach those? And like, what was your way of doing something different with the underwater sequences? Yeah, it was really, there were a couple of things. First of all, we didn't use the Alexa underwater. We used a red dragon and we shot 5K. So we had a bit of flexibility because we were finishing to 2K. So that left us a bit of flexibility in terms of how we could use the images subsequently. Um, we had a huge tank in Sweden and we blacked out the whole tank. And then we built the hull of the boat in the tank. Um, so that the uh, the actor is diving down and, and we were so lucky Hermione is a brilliant actor and I cast her because she's a brilliant actor and after I'd cast her it turned out she used to be a competitive swimmer so she's really really comfortable in the water uh, and that was extraordinary she ended up doing all of her own stunts uh, including wow. she dives Amazing. into this 10 meter dive tank um, at the end of the story where she dives right down and, uh, and that's all her, that's all her really doing that dive. Um, she was really fearless. So she, she spent five days underwater. The animal in the story is all rooted in truth. It's because I'm really nerdy. I, uh, I wanted oh, it wow. to be something, everything that the animal does and everything that the animal is, is something that is drawn from life. So there's nothing that it does or is that isn't something that an animal somewhere does or is. Um, and I, uh, I approached a zoologist, uh, a marine zoologist uh, here in Dublin, the university, and went, this is the design of the animal. What would you say if you saw it? And he went, well, I think that looks like a nadarian to me, which is a jellyfish. I went, could a nadarian be that size? He went, oh, yeah. Wow. So it's huge and it is rooted in truth. And it has this bioluminescent quality because I wanted it to be really, really beautiful. You know, it's not a monster. Right. It's, um, the idea isn't that we make a monster that you know, you have to defeat. The idea is that you encounter something incomprehensible, another form of life. The idea is it's not about us. It's not about, you know, why. Life just is. And life is independently of us and has nothing to do with us. And, you know, we're a part of it and that we're a part of a dynamic system, but it's not responsive necessarily to us. It's just kind of doing its thing and it doesn't have a reason to be, it just is. So that was sort of the idea that we'd have something really beautiful mesmeric and gorgeous that uh, that Hermione would be able to engage with and what I really didn't want to do in those underwater sequences was have you know one actor on her own having to act against a tennis ball because it's just so hard even though I right. knew we were going to have to put in all this CG afterwards so what I did was I found two puppeteers who were absolutely brilliant and really up for it and built this massive great big thing that had LED lights in it that we could put underwater. What? And then they jumped into wetsuits <laughs> and puppeteered underwater so that Hermione has something to play off. And also, because as you know, when you're shooting underwater, the play of light, you're never going to be able to reproduce that in post, right? It's all quite chaotic right. and the physics of it right. are really complicated. So it was much better to have this thing producing LED bioluminescence that was producing all this kind of shadow and flicker and light and reflection in the water. And then afterwards, once we captured that footage at 5K, we were able to bring that into the CG environment and then draw over that animal and make it pulsing and make it bioluminescent wow. and make it semi-transparent and gorgeous and rich and lovely. But she does actually have something that she's playing against in real life. Do people ever say no to you? Like, um, oh, I don't want them off. to. I think these are good ideas. I just want to know because it feels like you you just like are just this amazing force and you get to do all these creative things. 
Oh God, all the time. It's you, you guys are filmmakers. You know exactly what it's like. It is pushing a rock up a hill all the time, all the time. We went to, uh, to talk to the Coast Guard about the fact that we were filming. And as you know, when you're filming, you have the boat that is the subject that you're filming. You've got a camera boat and you also have to have a separate boat, which is a security boat with all of the uh, professional rescue people in it. And you have to have divers in the water all the time to protect the actors. So it's a wow. massive undertaking and really expensive. Uh, so we went out and we talked to the Coast Guard and we explained, I'll never forget this, we were standing on the pier, a whole bunch of us, you know, me, the producers, the line producer, the, uh, the uh, safety advisor, the stunt coordinator, uh, the director of cinematography, all standing around talking to the Coast Guard. And he went, it'll never work. <laughs> he said the Irish Sea it's in the, the Atlantic Ocean off the coast of Ireland it's too wild it'll never work you'll never be able to shoot it the boat won't be able to go out you'll never be able to have the safety boats out the divers won't be able to he was just he was such a voice of doom so yes people are always saying no but you still did it but we <laughs> did it you just have to smile and nod and go we will make everybody's safety our priority which we totally did uh, you know, it's not worth it uh, to make anything other than at the absolutely safest way that you can. So going back to the underwater stuff, um, you talked about this this puppet that you guys built and that you had your actor being able to react off of. Um, was that also true for when it's latched onto the hull, yes. the hull yes. in the movie? Yeah. And and what did that look like and how different <laughs> was it, um, you know, from, you know, what you guys shot practically? Uh, it's The practical version is like a simpler version. It's a simpler version of what you see in the movie. So in the movie, you can see that the thing is alive and, um, and like a deep sea animal, it's semi-translucent and you can see the bioluminescence and you can see its shimmer and movement and little shivers wow. of life. So in, in the original thing, it, does, it doesn't quite have that level of verisimilitude. But um, but the puppeteers are proper puppeteers, and they really they they really did a super job. So it ga it made it very easy yeah. for us to do it in CG. So it's really like a combination of CG and practical. In yeah, the end, yeah. I mean, um, that's awesome. I I know uh, only fifty percent of the people in the room have uh, have seen the movie, so I'll be very careful what I say. But there is another moment where there are very uh, little little tiny animals, and um, and they are live action they are created using wow. seaweed with them um, iron filings inside them and then oh, our puppeteer amazing. is uh, they're in the sink and our puppeteer is underneath the sink moving a magnet under the sink to make all these little animals wriggle around in the sink that's amazing so cool. um last question about practical effects and and versus cgi the the part in the film where the tendrils pop out of the tank in the film was that also puppeted or was that all no, CGI? no that was completely cg okay wow it's really, really well done. Beautiful. Uh, well, we had an absolutely brilliant CG designer. He is a real artist, an absolutely brilliant guy called Alex Hansen, uh, who worked out of Gothenburg in Sweden. Uh, so we were just constantly Skyping, he and I, and we'd be sending images back and forth going, what if it were this? What if it were this? What if it were this? There is one, I'm not going to tell you which one it is, but there is one shot in the film, which is a close-up of Hermione that I shot dry for wet on the soundstage wow. with Hermione in wow. full gear. And I sent it to Alex going, I need you to make this look like she's underwater. And he went, I can't, that's impossible. And then he sent it back to me and it was absolutely brilliant. And wow. because it's it's <laughs> cut in with other footage that is shot underwater. So it had to be indistinguishable from the real thing. And it really is, nobody has spotted it. Yeah, I didn't notice. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you finish to 2K? You said that earlier and I never got to jump in with it. What, what I mean, for distribution? It was about trying to keep costs down. Uh, oh. It was about trying to keep costs down in the, uh, in the post-production environment, particularly with the CG, because the thing that costs you money is the storage. Right, 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 right. You weren't concerned with distribution or a platform requiring the 4K master or anything like that? Um, no, I, I, no, it never really arose. I know for, uh, I know Netflix wants you to finish to 4K and I understand that. We just couldn't afford it. On our budget, it was impossible for us because of the kind of film that it is, uh, because of the fact that we were going to have to do so much CG afterwards, we just couldn't afford the storage. Wow. 
Yeah, yeah, I, I can see that. I mean, just with the scope of what you could accomplish and, uh, you know, shooting on a boat underwater, all that stuff with the cast you had, the practical effects and the, the CGI effects you had and all yeah. this, the things that happened in the film. Um, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> this film follows kind of a structure that a lot of other like sci-fi and horror films have followed in the past, like, you know, people being uh you know locked up in one space and isolated and then like some force comes and then they have to deal with it or whatever um we've seen this many many times throughout so many movies but uh my question to you is how did you approach making this something unique and special and how did you succeed <laughs> <laughs> well i'm glad you it's think so we hard, did. that's the you know? important oh, thing right <laughs> absolutely no it was so it's so captivating um, and fresh and different feeling. And I think what you said earlier about the origin of the story kind of speaks to it in a lot of ways. But um, I just want to hear, like, you know, when you're tackling this kind of thing, like, what did you have in mind to make it different? Well, for me, it always comes down to trying to make it truthful, right? You're trying to say something that that's emotionally truthful and that feels authentic. So the first thing that I that I always do if I'm uh, when I'm writing a story is, to try and research as much as I can, because the truth is always weirder than anything that you can make up. So researching the truth of what it's like to live on those trawlers was just extraordinary. And, um, you know, the danger and the vulnerability and the fact that they are so economically vulnerable, you know, especially now. And they're all super aware of climate change because all of the uh, waters in the shallow Atlantic have all been overfished. And what it means is that those fishing boats are having to go deeper and deeper and deeper and take greater and greater risks for their own personal safety um, in order to find uh, a good catch. And even then, you know, they're at the mercy of the shoals and at the mercy of the weather. So that in itself is kind of a brilliant story. And that in itself is a story about the climate crisis. Um, and so thinking as I was that I wanted to make a story about the ethics of the scientific method versus magical thinking, that all sort of coalesced together. And I think it's often the way, you know, when you have an idea for a story and you start to investigate, you know, the way you get to a certain point where everything seems to be flowing into the story that you want to tell and everything seems to be contributing to the story that you want to tell. So that raw economic need and that idea of people who were really, really aware of urgent ecolo ecological concerns and have to make these horrible Hobson's choices between, you know, taking responsibility for their crew members and for their community by going out and getting the work and, and making the profit and making sure everybody is secure and can feed their families versus uh, um, the greater kind of uh, community need of, uh, of saying, well, this is unsustainable and actually we're destroying our planet if we keep doing this. And that's a really, really difficult choice for people to have to make. So personally, I'm not that interested in films that have villains. I think it's much more interesting when you put people in difficult situations and, and allow them truthfully to try to navigate those situations. So once I knew I wanted to tell a story about science and magical thinking, about taking responsibility uh, for ourselves and for each other, then everything in the story starts to flow towards that. You know, how is everybody in the story locked in this um, difficult set of choices about taking responsibility for themselves and for each other and how are they in conflict with one another so i just wanted to know like i see shorts i see series i fe see feature work what um what how do you make the decisions you do in terms of jumping from project to project you have to you have to kind of be led by your heart don't you you have to i think as writers and directors we have a responsibility to tell stories that have meaning you know, um, particularly now in this moment where, you know, we're all kind of locked in and we're all at home. And what do we turn to? We turn to stories. Stories are the way that we communicate with each other. Stories are the way that we decide what our morality and our ethics are. Stories are the ways that we understand each other's emotional lives. And cinema in particular is so good at that. So I feel like our responsibility as storytellers is to tell stories that matter and tell stories that have meaning because they are the building blocks out of which we make our world. Well, I love that. Um, could, <laughs> but could you also, not to take away the poetry of the moment, but like, how do you decide business wise? Like, how do you pitch yourself or like what projects do you decide to pitch yourself for? Or is it always whether it hits you and, you know, hits you, it touches you emotionally? I think it depends. I think I know that uh, the people listening to this program are uh, are people who are interested in being filmmakers or people who are filmmakers. And it depends on what stage of your career you're at. 
Um, I remember talking to a, a director many years ago who said there are two types of filmmaker, there are two types of director, those who actually work and those who sit in a bar telling you about the great film that they're going to make that they never make. So to a certain extent, at the beginning of your career, you have to kind of grab every opportunity that you get because you get better by doing it. You don't get better mm. by sitting around talking about it. So at the beginning of your career, you're not going to get offered, you know, the most fantastic, beautiful screenplay or the most brilliant, perfect, endless budget. You are going to get offered things that feel like a compromise and you're going to get offered things that feel like they're not quite a great fit. And your job as a filmmaker is to bring your whole self to that work and make it as good as you can and make it as authentic and beautiful and honest as you can and leave your fingerprints all over it and then move on to the next thing. And, and I feel like that's how we get better. It looks like you've done a lot of television work in your career. I just wanted to hear about process a little bit and like how you approach working on a TV show versus a film or is it the same but different? Like, how do you walk into like, you know, like let's say shooting an episode of, or directing an episode of Jessica Jones, for instance, like how do you, what, what do you bring to that project versus like when you did Sea Fever? Well, I think, uh, you know, referring to your previous question, I would never take something on that I didn't think I could make great and that I didn't already think was interesting and truthful and exciting. Uh, and I loved making Jessica Jones because I really love the showrunner, Melissa Rosenberg, and I really share a worldview. And I thought it was a terrific and groundbreaking drama. And it also spoke to the things that I love. It's a brilliant thriller. It's a terrific noir it uses all of the artillery of cinema. You know, it's incredibly spectacular. Uh, and it's also witty and sharp and it's got, it's quite arch, but it's got great narrative drive. So I really loved it and I really wanted to contribute to it. And I knew I could contribute well to it because I understand it. Um, so I, I met Mel um, and I knew I wanted to work with her, loved Kristen. We worked together on an episode and then they said to me, will you come back and do a whole load of the second season? or the third season, sorry, and I couldn't because I was making Sea Fever. And I actually broke off Sea Fever. I finished the shoot and I flew over to New York to shoot the finale, the finale wow. finale of Jessica Jones with Mel and Kristen Ritter uh, wow. because I love the show so much and I love the work that she does and I love the stories that she tells. And, and like we were saying, I think, you know, they are the building blocks of culture and she's asking really interesting questions and she's telling a story that is a proper, exciting noir hero story with a female protagonist, which you almost never get. Um, so that was really thrilling. It was really fun. And the, all of the cast in that show are brilliant. Uh, and the aesthetics are really beautiful. And then I came back and I edited Sea Fever. And I mean, Mel, is a, she's generous enough to, to be very uh, collaborative. So as a director, you have quite a lot of input. Well, and then also just you're so established and you, you seem to jump from project to project, just like you were just saying. At what point were you a full-time storyteller or did you start out being a full-time storyteller? So, much, so many of us are trying to figure out how do we lead sustainable lives doing what we love? And I just want to see, did you start out in that way or was there a transition? transition to full-time work? Well, I, you know what? I think that's a brilliant question and it's a really practical question. And I think people don't ask it often enough. It took me years to realize that a lot of the people around me who were film, indie filmmakers were not earning their money from being indie filmmakers. They had other uh, sources of income um, and, uh, and I didn't. So it was always going to be a question of how do you make a living? How do you make sure that you can pay your bills and have children if you want to? and do all of those things and make the kind of work that you want to make. And, you know, certainly for me working in Europe, television was uh, was a really good solution to that. And I was lucky enough to hit television, of course, when it was kind of transforming and turning into something that was much more cinematic. Um, but it is, a, it is a great way both to hone your skills and to articulate the kind of stories that you want to articulate, as well as giving you uh, a sufficiency of income to allow you to take the time to develop your own projects. Really quickly, going back to the Jessica Jones story, um, you talked about loving the material and really being into the story and and, to, and the creator of the show. Um, but how did that opportunity come about? Did you seek out uh, working on that show or did they find you first? Like, talk to us about how it actually happened. I think uh, I think the advice that I would give people listening is um, do go do go with your heart in terms of what you want to make. Uh, find the people that can understand you and that you understand and who you can really contribute to. So from my point of view, what happened was uh, 
to, to do the long version of the story, um, I, I made a, a thriller in the UK called Scott and Bailey, and I did a big finale for that. And out of that, I met a writer called Sally Wainwright, who was working on a show called Happy Valley. And I ended up making Happy Valley with her, which is an absolutely brilliant feminist noir thriller. It's really gothic, but it's really rooted in truth. And her characters are absolutely gorgeous and very rich and very complex and strange. And um, that was what uh, got the attention of uh, Jessica Jones. So they they then approached me and oh, asked wow. me would I um, would I open it for them, which I couldn't. Um, but uh, I ended up meeting uh, another pair of writers, uh, Dawn Presserich and Nicole York, and who had just come off a show called The Killing in the US, and um, and they were making oh, a yes. drama about Zelda Fitzgerald, who was another strange, arch, interesting figure. So I ended up making this fantastic, lush, not, uh, beautiful early twentieth century drama with them, set in you know jazz age New York. Um, and because we liked each other and understood each other and, and fed off each other, then they asked me, would I come back and work with them again this year? And we're ju we just had our shoot interrupted. We're doing a nine part thriller uh, called Hit and Run, which is a big international mystery thriller for, uh, for Netflix. So, you know, you develop relationships, you make work wow. that, that feels right for you, that speaks to you that you think has value and asks interesting questions and other people who are interested in those things find you out of that work. Awesome advice. And I love hearing how these things happen. And, and it's like always what, kind what of What one circuitous. project leads to yeah, another. You never quite know yeah. how it's going to happen or when it's going to happen. But but if you make the work that, that you believe in, people will find you. Um, well, to cap off the show, we do uh, a last a run of last rapid fire questions to prepare yourself, <laughs> Nia. So, um, so what's the first film you ever made, whether short or long form, and, and how do you feel about it now? Uh, oh, gosh. I think the first film I ever made was a film called Olive, which I made for 10,000 euro. Uh, and it was fantastic fun. I was making documentaries with the public service broadcaster here, and uh, I wrote and directed this film. And it screened in competition at the Berlin Alice. So that was pretty exciting. What's the best filmmaking advice you've ever received? John Borman was very kind to me early in my career. Uh, and I had a couple of conversations oh, wow. with him that really stayed with me. One was always be across the budget because you will be blamed either way. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you should always know what the budget is. And also very uh, practically, Sometimes when the producers are, are trying to set up a very, very difficult tight budget, they may not understand exactly what you need and they may under budget some crucial element. And if you're across the budget, you will be better able to say, look, I can scrimp on this. I know how to do that more cheaply than you think. And we could use that money and bring it over here rather than having this horrible surprise when you're halfway through the sheet of going, there's no money left and we spent all that money on a rain machine that we didn't really need or whatever. So it's very good advice. <laughs> the other advice John Borman gave me, which I absolutely love, is when you want to do one thing and the producers want to do another and you are absolutely convinced that you want your way is better, go your way. And then if it's a disaster, it's your fault. <laughs> Amazing. But actually, both those pieces of advice are about taking responsibility for your own work. You know, don't let yourself be bullied, um, but also take responsibility for what you're doing. And if you make a mistake, it's your mistake. I feel like you already answered this one, but do you have a goal, like an ultimate goal as an independent storyteller? And if so, what is it? My goal is to make a big, brilliant Hollywood thriller for $100 million. I love it. Wow. <laughs> yes. I love yes. it. It's amazing. <laughs> Uh, if you could go back in time, what's one piece of advice you would give yourself? It's the same advice that every aspiring filmmaker always gets, which is keep working, keep getting better, keep doing it, keep going, don't stop. Do you know what I would say? And it's not particularly advice for myself, but, but uh, it's advice for anybody out there who's working on a story. There's a degree to which the industry and what gets funded is about fashion and what comes in and out of fashion. And there's a degree to which who gets funded is to do with your track record and how how much you look like a safe pair of hands because ultimately the financiers are taking a gamble they're taking a gamble on you that if they give you this massive amount of money that you will make it back for them and that's quite a big gamble so it's no harm or it's not surprising that they're kind of trying to look for a track record they're trying to understand if you're trustworthy they're trying to understand if their money will be safe with you um, so there's all these kinds of different criteria that are coming into play when you're trying to make a film that you as a filmmaker don't always completely have a handle on at the beginning of your career. You think if I just write a great screenplay, it's going to happen. 
And actually that's not all of it. It is quite complex. So I think if you have a screenplay and it's not getting traction, my advice is don't keep rewriting it. Write something else. You have learned from that screenplay. If you've finished it and it's not moving, write another one. It'll be better than the one you've just written and you will use all the things that you learned in the ones you've just written, but you never know. It may find a market in the way the first one didn't. Is making movies hard? Making movies is so hard. <laughs> 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 oh, that's awesome. And then the follow up to that. Um, so why do you do it? Oh, God, it is the best job in the world. Isn't it Orson Welles who said it's like having the best ever train set? That is so completely <laughs> true. You know, uh, if you are somebody who loves writing, if you're somebody who loves performance, if you're somebody who loves images and imagery and drawing, if you're somebody who's interested in maths and science and the technology behind it, it just speaks to absolutely every part of your interest and excitement. You know, you get to work, you get to build visual worlds, you get to work with talented, able actors who can make your words sound incredibly magical and beautiful and truthful. You get to work with incredible cinematographers. You get to work with sound designers who can build a space and make the world come to life. You get to work with musicians who can make something emotional and touching and truthful. I mean, it is just the best job ever, right? Yeah, it is pretty amazing. Uh, the collaboration of filmmaking is something that, yeah, it's very special. And it's, um, I think uh, it's J.P. Dunleavy, the writer, who said uh, telling stories, I think it works equally for filmmaking as it does for writing, is uh, one of the few careers where you take the worst, most personal, private experiences of your life and you turn them into money. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> But it's true that the more the more honest you are and the more unpolished you are about your real emotions and the things that you are really afraid of or really excited about, and the more you can pour that unvarnished honesty into your script, the more your script will resonate with other people. Great advice after great advice <laughs> from you. This is awesome. Um, so where should people go if they want to learn more about you, Niesa? Do you have a website? Uh, should they go to your IMDb? Do you have a Twitter? Oh, uh, all of that. Um, all They should definitely just cyberstalk me. I'm, uh, I have a website, okay. <laughs> which is niesahardyman.com. I'm on IMDb. I'm on Twitter. The film is going to be available. It was going to be released across the US, but unfortunately, circumstances are such that it's going to be VOD. But you can find out how to download right. it on cfevermovie.com. Uh, and I would encourage everybody to go and see it or to at least download it and have a look because it is weirdly timely in terms of what it talks about, about take, yeah. taking responsibility for your health and the health of the people around you and taking responsibility for the world. Yeah, and it's got a great ending and it's beautiful. Um, and uh, yeah, I really enjoyed it. As a fan of this kind of genre and this kind of film, I really liked it a lot. And uh, yeah, so big, big endorsement from me. Well, that... <laughs> That is high praise indeed, because I know you are a total cineast. <laughs> we did it. Well, We're done. well thank you so we much. That was, that was great. <laughs> Amazing. All right. Well, thank you for listening. And thanks to Niesa for being on our show. Uh, this is just a call to everyone to check out our website, makingmoviesishard.com. You can find links to things we talked about in this episode. Uh, you, if you want to get in contact with us, send an email to podcast at makingmoviesishard.com. Or you can find us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all the things at MMIH Podcast. I am at Liz Manischel on everything. And Ulrich... I am Ulrich B on Twitter. You can also find me on Facebook where I'm quite vocal and I will be your friend if you ask me to be. So, uh, yeah, you can find me there too. And all, all you friends out there, if you like the show, tell a friend. Uh, help us get the word out. Leave a review on iTunes or Stitcher. And thanks to Nessa and Ulrich for a great episode and talk to everyone next week. You can hear my baby crying. You can hear him crying uh, in the background. I love it. Colin is just the best, like, extra co-host of the show. <laughs> He's awesome. <laughs>